There you go. Everyone, it's Gordon Einstein. Uh, we are doing our first on-site Dubai Crypto Wednesdays flash interview, if you like. I'm in, as it sounds like, lovely Dubai. I'm on the rooftop of my hotel, and there's a very active business and crypto community here. I put the word out, and my first guest, uh, Wasim Mabluk, I'm working on everyone's names, Wasim, um, was kind enough to make himself known and as someone who'd be willing to do a what I call a flash interview with Crypto Wednesdays, um, comes very highly recommended. Um, my good friend Arena Heaver recognized him and said, that's a good one. You can definitely interview him. I was like, fine. He, he passed the vetting process in all of 15 seconds. So that was, that was great. Yeah, she's fantastic. You know, the, 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 you know, if George is the mayor of Dubai, she, she's the queen of Dubai. You know, so, so she informs Absolutely. me. Um, so, we'll see, you know, let me... This is just sort of ad hoc, and we're just going to roll with it. Let, let me pass it to you. Tell us, tell us about you, your projects that you're involved in, and like I always say, the just like the Wolverine has an origin story. I want to know your origin story. And by the way, you're the first person I've ever interviewed who's in Saudi Arabia, so I'm honored. And let me just kind of hand yeah. it to you. And uh, do me a favor, come a little bit more towards the camera, just so you fill up the screen maybe a little bit more. Yeah. So everyone can see your smiling face. A let me move it a little bit and see. Sure. Is that better? Uh, not really. Come come okay. closer if you can. We'll try again. Yes. We'll try again. Let's swing it back around. Is that good? Uh, definitely better. Okay, fantastic. So please, I'm handing you the microphone. Just lay it on us. And I'm going to interrupt, but it's yours. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my own origin story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it is an interesting uh, path that I've taken and I think uh, probably rather unique in many ways. But in this industry, if we can call crypto an industry, and I, I believe it is now uh, one, we'll get into that. But in this industry, maybe it's not so unusual. And, and there are many, many interesting stories how people got here. So, mm. um, you know, first of all, Saudi Arabia, I've been here most of my life. Uh, my father was an employee of the uh, large oil company here, the, the biggest in the world, Aramco, Saudi mm. Aramco. And uh, so I grew up here and got to know a lot of very intelligent and uh, interesting people as well that way. Uh, as part of the community, it's a very international community. It is uh, based, at, we're in the Eastern province. Behind me, you'll see uh, views of Riyadh. Of course, I travel back and forth between EP and uh, Riyadh, which is in the central region. And, and actually, um, let, let me interrupt, start interrupting. So is Eastern province a descriptor or is it actually the name of the province? And I'll show my, the fact I need to learn many things. They do call it Eastern province. Okay, got it, okay. Yeah. And uh, it includes uh, the area of Dahran, which is where Aramco is based. And then you have um, Al Khobar, uh, Dammam, you have uh, Jubeir, the industrial city here. Mm. And uh, it is, as you can see with the cranes and the buildings and everything uh, in the background, it is a boom town, you know, really to, to coin a, a, a more American phrase. It is a boom town, and, and there are uh, many amazing opportunities here mm. um, and, and incredible things happening. Uh, my, my background, having been in Aramcon for many years and having lived here and then gone abroad and studied uh, commercial law and uh, uh, information security, so IT stuff as well. Um, you're, you're my kind of guy, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you, I don't know if we, if we even got into it, but I'm a blockchain and cryptocurrency attorney, and I also studied IT and have an IT company. So we're 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 parallel Excellent. souls. So yeah, go go deep on that. Yeah, and you can't lose with a name like Einstein. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, how can you lose with that? It's perfect. It's money in the bank. Uh, I'm, I'm so, trying. You know, so. good. Tell my banker. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, go ahead, please. Go go ahead. Yeah. So, so, you know, having that background, it was, I think it was inevitable that this was going to happen, you know, to coin a uh, popular Elon Musk tweet uh, mm -hmm. as a term of, of reference. Um, it was inevitable um, when, when you look at the way cryptography has developed and has morphed into now uh, basically a means of uh, exchanging value and exchanging uh, data on a mass scale. 
um, and, and the science behind uh, crypto. Mm -hmm. um, you see, so that is really one amazing aspect of it, the technical side. And then, you know, um, when you look at also the financial aspect of it, um, I am involved in a project that is very exciting and near and dear uh, mm -hmm. to my heart, which is uh, the Nimbus uh, project and, you know, basically decentralized finance um, with the apps that put uh, a bank in your hands, essentially, right? If you have okay. a, a laptop or, or a mobile phone. And Nimbus is very exciting in that regard. It kind of helps me pull together all of the different parts of my own experience. Uh, and uh, it is actually, uh, it's our baby. We like to call it, it's kind of the second coming. Uh, mm -hmm. This company was started about two years ago and had a totally different platform to start. And then we kind of began changing it. And it well, sorry, let, me, let me break in. So Nimbus did a pivot, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. And it, it, what was the original model? And has the team kind of stayed the same? And what, what, what made you transition? So let us know a little bit about that. Yeah, so the original model was more of an, um, they had an arbitrage service and they had a way that you could invest funds directly and get um, a return on your money in that traditional sense, kind of like a bank, but virtual. So I would call that the virtual bank version in a way. Um, what we're doing now is completely different in that we're um, s sort of, you know, giving the um, investors an opportunity to shift gears and move more towards things like crowdfunding, um, the IPO hub, we're going to have an IPO hub, uh, we're going to have different ways that the users can then um, sort of get value out of the platform. We have about 50,000 users, which is, hmm. it's, it's good and it's challenging. Uh, and, uh, you know, to get them from the old way of doing things into the new way of doing things is it has been very interesting. It's been an interesting journey. And can you flesh that out? Really, I, mean, I, I, think, I think what you're alluding to is one of the things we all struggle with, which is, you know, for crypto and DeFi and this new model to work, it needs to be user friendly. It needs to be seamless. It needs to be PayPal or easier. Correct. And I think you're alluding to the the last mile, what I call the last mile, which is the customer and making it seamless for them. So can you, sounds like you have some insight there. Can you flesh that out a little bit? Yes. And uh, actually very, very important question and very important point. Um, to do it all out of the box immediately I think would have been a very big mistake. So mm. our CEO for this transition wisely said, hey, let's start with the tokenomics. Let's go ahead, let's launch our token. Let's get the users involved. Let them start uh, swapping and using it for different transactions. And then once we gain that sort of critical mass, and I'm not talking about a huge amount of time, probably uh, weeks in between, mm -hmm. we will go for you know, the bigger exchange, Uniswap in this case, and uh, allow the entire market to access then our services and our token and, and our platform. Mm, okay, interesting. And then the, maybe you said it, I'm sorry if I missed it. What was, what was the moment you pivoted or what was the instigation for pivoting the model? Was there like a moment or what, what was the flash? Yeah, so I think uh, basically what has happened is we had a lot of changes in management, we had a lot of people moving in and out, mm -hmm. and we had a change in terms of the way we wanted to run the project and the way we wanted to deliver the services. And the main uh, cause for that was probably uh, our CEO who came in and changed a lot of things at the time. And you may know Fernando, I think uh, he's part of the community and mm -hmm. he's a well-known guy. I don't think it's hard to miss him. Uh, and uh, so uh, basically, basically um, he came in and sort of said, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and let's do it very carefully, right? Mm -hmm. Because now you have this resource intensive process that people are doing, you know, Polkadot, I'm just using it as an example, and it's a very popular one. They built an entire new blockchain, right? And uh, multi-platform and, and so on and so forth, multi-chain um, system and so on. And they came with it out of the box, right? So you'll have like 300, 340 
or so some odd projects of that sort right now. Um, and you can go to coin market cap and you can find, you know, the top 600 uh, coins and tokens and they're all there. Uh, but then the question is, are they all like polka dot or are, are some of them going to end up kind of like a dodge coin, right? Which is basically a coin with no project. And but but, but yet seems, really to doing, it seems to be doing somehow very well. <laughs> all of a yeah, sudden. you know, <laughs> it's worth mentioning. It's worth mentioning the power of social media mm -hmm. and the Reddit craze with people just piling into investments mm. and sort of uh, they use it as an investment vehicle, although it has no other value. Same thing with GameStop, right? GameStop is a bankrupt company that has, well, they have money on the books to keep their business running. Yes. Mm. Okay. I'm not going to say bankrupt entirely, but bankrupt in terms of what's the future of GameStop and how is it going to compete and how is it going to stay alive? Mm -hmm. But they used it as a trading vehicle and they used other people's positions against them to create value for the holders of that particular investment vehicle, which is just the GameStop share. Now, right? I, I'm going to ask a very, I'm going to ask a very innocent question. When you say you used it as a trading table, that yeah. sounds evocative, but I don't know quite what you mean. Can you explain that? So the, as a trading vehicle, you see, uh, one of the things that made that one in particular, my finance background is going to come through a little bit here, but uh, one of Bring the things on. that made that particularly good is naked shorting or shorting shares that may or may not actually exist. And yeah. that is so that the larger funds, particularly hedge funds can boost their returns by using derivatives and using things like shorting um, in an inordinate manner, using leverage and uh, basically juicing their returns mm -hmm. in order to bring in more investors, which I, technically is kind of like a Ponzi scheme, but no one on Wall Street will ever call it that. Mm -hmm. But they're using things that don't exist to pull people in and generate returns, and they've been allowed to get away with it for a very long time. This thing has been around since the launch of the dot-coms in the late 90s and right. on a massive scale. And I remember, I mean, I'll, I'll date, I guess I'll date myself, but the one of the big issues in 2008 cr crash was shorting, you know, and yep. and that wasn't the first time that shorting securities has been an issue. And it's so ironic to me that it's the institutional players who are shorting. It's Reddit who basically called them out and said the emperor has no clothes, you know, going long, which is supposedly Correct. the capitalism fr friendly thing. And yet the regulators are sort of being called upon by the institutional people to stop the longs and protect the shorts. It kind of goes a long distance to, to showing who has the power. And the, yeah. the me, I mean, just to be a little bit cynical myself, just to be like the meaninglessness of the, of the moralistic posturing against shorts. Isn't it interesting yes. how it's flipping based on who has the power, not on the underlying mechanics of the market? It's, it's yeah. Kind of got me on fire. I mean, I'm not like Mr. GameStop fan, and I'm not living on Reddit. But it, when I saw what Citadel was doing, and when I saw that Robinhood was denying the ability to buy, you could only sell. Correct. Now they, you know, they kind of gave this protectual thing about the SEC that I, I don't 100 percent buy. But it was like it that that really reemphasized the need for me for DeFi, crypto, global algorithm, algorithmic compliance, and not yes, not sort of subjective paper compliance not compliance based on words and power but like code compliance go ahead yes and it's 100 percent correct and that's why we really do need to democratize finance right take it out of the hands of the so-called regulators okay and uh in our marketplace when we talk about the the granddaddy of them all right the bitcoin exchanges the big ones we do have shorting right and we do have derivatives now we do have futures contracts we we have uh the all of the hallmarks of a traditional financial market mm -hmm. but then when it comes to regulation kind of depends where you're sitting right and who owns the crypto mm -hmm. uh, and so we're at a stage where this challenge of democratizing finance for everyone is going to involve a number of regulatory hurdles to jump over and uh, hoops to jump through, but also it's going to uh, keep us on our toes, I think, to a large extent, because here's the thing. 
no one can really take it away from you unless it's sitting on an exchange or somewhere else where you don't control it. And right. that's the big difference, right, with crypto. It's democratizing because you can use it to avoid sanctions. And some people will tell you that that might be illegal, but it's not always. Uh, you can use it to avoid nationalization of your resources if you're in a place like, you know, some South American country and there's a dictator that comes to power and he decides, I'm going to nationalize this entire industry and you could lose everything. Or right? heaven forbid, or or, have forbid a, a nice European country like Cyprus. Exactly. And you can you know. avoid also uh, currency, uh, currency devaluations and problems we're facing. You know, in the Middle East, we have a big challenge with Lebanon and other places where the economy is crumbling and the currency is basically uh, going towards zero. And I, so, sorry, I'm, I'm going to totally take this conversation in a different direction. So I, I, one of the yes. things I remember during 2008 was Lebanon not having a banking crisis because I remember hearing again and again that they're fantastically conservative with their loans, that they need, you know, you, you have to be a member of the community. You need references from people. And there's sort of a, a, you know, do you vouch for this person dynamic? And they were holding that out as an alternative model to say the U.S. model, which is, Basically, you know, what, someone originates the loan, then they sell it to someone who packages it in, you know, one large collateral, you know, collateralized debt object. Um, yeah. And, and then passes it around. And I remember, like, not that Lebanon was on, uh, was on a Sharia-based banking system, but just their model was so conservative that they rode out the wave. And, and now I'm hearing about the Lebanese economy having issues. And, and I wonder, just if you can quickly comment, is it at all banking originated or banking affected? Or is it sort of like the real economy having an issue? Or how would you characterize it? Yeah. You know, uh, the banking industry, the bankers themselves uh, are professionals in, in a place like Lebanon. You can find very professional bankers there. Mm. They have held traditionally large gold reserves uh, versus mm. their obligations. They have not missed debt payments per se. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a part of uh, their, their business practice. They're actually, they run their finance industry in a very professional way. Mm -hmm. The problems that Lebanon has faced are kind of existential to a large extent and also unfortunately uh, corruption driven, mm -hmm. right? And so when you have people in positions of power that are expatriating capital at an amazing rate. And then suddenly you have a currency crisis and a run on the banks. And then they say yeah. to you, what, what you can you can, do? <laughs> yeah, they say to you, oh, you have thousands and, um, and maybe even more in the bank, but you can withdraw a thousand dollars today. We'll give you a thousand dollars. And you know, if that's enough for you, then fine, maybe you can live on it. There are people I know that I think are only getting from their bank a hundred dollars a day at this stage, right? So crypto solves a lot of those problems. Yes. And that's really right. That's one of the big value propositions in crypto. Not only that, but also the peer to peer nature of it and avoiding the middlemen, because the financiers are the middlemen. The bankers are the middlemen in our traditional systems. And they take fees accordingly. They set rates accordingly. And sometimes they are irresponsible with your money. And you find out only too late, right? And you have to bear the loss because it's somewhere there, like the Robin Hood traders in the terms and conditions. They signed something somewhere and it said it was okay for them to do that. But and even if they didn't funding, sign it, the government basically says, we don't care if you signed it. I mean, if you look at the Cyprus situation, it's not that anyone signed saying the government can nationalize it, right. but they just took it. Uh, I think to just play off your point, there's... I don't necessarily mind intermediaries who add value, but I think the big killer is custodianship. The, yes. Because that, that, that leads to seizure. To the extent that someone can you know, add value by connecting two parties that wouldn't normally be connected and for their mutual benefit, that's fine. But right. if they do that by a smart contract where it never passes through that central point, but like they manage a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, I think there's a great DeFi and crypto opportunity there. Yes, absolutely. And one of the most, I think, interesting things and important things about crypto now mm. and just coming circling back. And one of the most important things is being able to put people's actual um, finance, um, let's say their, the value of their assets mm -hmm. in their own hand. Right. Yes. Good point. So when we talk about financial instruments and and the value of your assets, 
um, we're putting it back in the people's hands. Now, valuation remains in crypto uh, land a challenging factor, right? Because mm -hmm. you still you still have a highly unregulated trading environment, um, but you have regulated instruments and institutions entering, and they know how to play the game. Especially when you talk about something, an instrument I'm I'm familiar with, only 21 million bitcoins will ever exist. Mm -hmm. The illiquidity. The illiquidity of that currency is extremely important for people to understand because it's not the entire 21 million that we're even talking about. First of all, there are a few million that have never been minted and mm -hmm. they're still being mined, right? And those will be mined over the next several, you know, uh, decades, in, over many years, yeah. over many years. Yeah. And so, and then you have the ones that have been lost, the ones that are locked away somewhere, the ones that someone's never going to sell. The thing with, with Bitcoin and some of these other cryptos, Ethereum is similar in many ways. The thing with it is, it is to some degree belief-based because it is the flip side of fiat currency and central banks around the world being allowed to print as much as they want at mm -hmm. will digitally. See, when people say that crypto is not real money, well, show me, show me these real trillions that are being printed now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, $15 trillion printed to support COVID-19, you know, and, and so where is that? You know, is that on an island somewhere? I, I'm pretty sure it could probably cover Australia if we printed it all, right? I mean, it's- yeah, Go it's to the moon enormous... back and circle the earth a couple of times, yes. <laughs> right, it's yeah. like when we were kids and we said a hundred bajillion, kajillion dollars. It's that kind of money, you know, that kind of a number. And most mm -hmm. people can't even fathom it, you know, a thousand billion in each trillion, what, you know, and then a thousand million in each billion. It's just magnitudes mm -hmm. of order and they're just printing away. And people, you know, they say, well, we're stable because we're pegged to the dollar. Sure, maybe, but you see the thing about a commodity super cycle, which many believe that we're in the midst of right now, commodity super cycle doesn't pay attention to, you know, you can still buy a, a, a pack of bubble gum at the local grocery store and it only costs a little bit more because we're not talking about bubblegum sized problems. It's right. how much does it cost for me to buy a house now or a car and what am I going to use to purchase it? And, and how many of that do I need? You know, for just a few Bitcoin, you can buy just about anything now. So, uh, but, but you, you don't know, want to give up your Bitcoin because you, because you know, and people don't 40, want yesterday. That's where, right. That's where the value comes from. But if I come to you and I say, Hey, give me a buck. Are you even going to think about it? For you? No. I'll give you two bucks. <laughs> and, and a cup of coffee. See, but in the, the old days, it was a buck because you, you could get an entire buck and live off of it for the whole winter. Right. Right? Oh, interesting. You could get with a silver dollar and you could live off of it for the entire winter. And that was, and you could feed your whole family, you know, and that was a dollar. That was a, a, a one silver dollar. So, so let me, there, there's, there's more to talk about, but I, I just got to keep within the, the flash interview format because I got them backing up here, but yeah. it's fascinating. Let, let's, let's give me two minutes on, if you can. Oh, I lost your video for a second. Um, give, give me, it's okay. Give me two or three minutes, if you can, on the business climate for crypto in Saudi and sort of the business climate in general. I know that's a, bit, a lot, but just give me the, the headlines. Yeah. So we have an amazing now, um, sort of we're living in a very interesting time where we have a lot of people, an amazing pool of human capital. Mm -hmm. um, they have, you know, studied at uh, top universities. Many of the youngsters I'm meeting here, the fresh grads, they speak English, you know, as well as us. Mm -hmm. um, they know the culture, the economy of the uh, European and other Western nations very, very well. They understand how things work. They know, um, you know, millennials, you don't need to force them to pick up a mobile phone and use WhatsApp or email. They no, you need to force them to, to not use WhatsApp. Right? They yeah. prefer it to regular conversation. Yes. And that's, when I think about crypto, I think about the future. The, the generations that came before you and myself, I'll, I'll put us in the same category, sure. uh, and, 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 you know, and so on, they're kind of, you know, they're further along, but thinking about that new generation that's coming up now, mm -hmm. there is a lot of potential. 
right? There is huge, enormous potential. And people are hungry for solutions, right? They're hungry for solutions and they want to get involved. I can't even tell you how many people walk up to me every day and ask me, what's going on with your WhatsApp group? What's this uh, thing you're doing on, uh, you know, with Nimbus? What's, mm -hmm. What are the D apps going to do for us in the future and how can we use them and so on? And I say to them, you know, very simple things. You have a project that you're working on. I saw that, you know, you've got an app or you've got some uh, real estate based project or something like that. Well, what if someone wants to be part of a commercial real estate project? You know, you can see the buildings and things behind me um, and but they don't have millions and millions of dollars. You can tokenize Token, it. Tokenize right? it. And, 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 Saudi, and then, Saudi specifically is embracing this. And it, it sounds like ripe, the youth are right. Yeah, it's absolutely right for it. Now, now, mm. how, what would it take to actually do it? You would have to go to our uh, central monetary authority. You would have to get the licensing and so on and so forth. However, however, they can still participate right through their international gateways, different things that they mm. want to do, payment gateways and so on. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, let's face it. The world is uh, is kind of flat now. You can do crypto on PayPal if you want them to own your keys. That's a whole entire other discussion. Yeah. Uh, and But essentially you could have everything on your mobile phone, on your laptop that you really need without having to write domicile in a place where you have to still do the licensing and everything else because it's it's just not been done before um, on a mass scale. But there are companies coming up. You know, Saudi Aramco, we mentioned it at the top of the show. They are one of the number one users of blockchain technologies now in this region. And that- you we're know, gonna do a yeah, I'm, I'm telling you right now, we're going to do a follow-up show just on that. And you, you're going to help sure. me form a panel on Aramco and blockchain. And we'll do a sure. longer format of that because that, that would be an amazing show. Uh, I like Absolutely. It. Now, I, unfortunately, I, I got to call time. So yes. it's been great. Uh, do me a favor. Send me all your social media links so that I can put them in the show description. And, so, and also a, a description of yourself and the project so I can put that and so people can reach out to you and make connections. And thank you for sure. being the first guest Crypto Wednesdays Dubai edition. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to drop links into our various WhatsApp chats and please share as well. So let me just give you one second to stop the recording. Bye, everyone.